Now, we're in the Messes and Miracles series. We're continuing in the book of Mark, so turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark 8, and we're going to look at this past today. I entitled it, Dying to be a Jesus Follower. Kind of a play on words, but we do have to die to self in order to follow Jesus. So we're going to be, we'll be looking at that over this passage, but there's something else that happened. Jesus has been uh, sharing with the disciples. They've been seeing who he is, and and they're watching all the miracles that are going on. And then Jesus proclaimed something today that kind of shocked the disciples. He said, in the near future, let me just share with you what's going to happen. I'm going to die. And I'm going to, be, I'm going to rise from the dead. He began to share with them about the future of what was going to happen in the kingdom of God. And it didn't fit well with the disciples, especially Simon Peter. It just didn't make sense. And so as we read this passage, kind of follow along this morning, think about that, and we're going to see how all that applies to our life today. Mark 8, verse 29. And he asked them, this is Jesus, said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me... And of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray and ask God to give us insight in this great passage. Father, as we, as we look to you this morning, we need your Holy Spirit to speak truth in our hearts. Lord, this passage is full of, of things about the disciples, about Simon Peter, about some of the things that Jesus wants us today to understand and know and take to heart. And so, Lord, let us not read this passage pointing a finger and looking back at where the disciples were, but God, may we see our lives, that we are your disciples, and that you are calling each one of us to follow you. So God, give us insight, wisdom, and help our hearts be tender and soft to the word that you want to speak into us today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If Jesus were here right now, and he was standing in front of you, and he was looking into your eyes, and I want this to be very personal right now, he's looking at each one of us, he's looking into your eyes, you know that he knows you, he knows your heart because Jesus knows everything about us, and he looks at us and asks this question, who do you say that I am? What would be your response? Think about that for a moment. Who do you say that I am? Wouldn't that be an awesome experience, but maybe a frightening experience at the same time? How would you respond? Well, look at how Peter responded. Look in verse 29. And Jesus asked him, Who do you say that I am? And you know old Peter, here he goes. And Peter answered him, You're the Christ. All right. Great job, Peter. And yet, I feel like we need maybe a little bit more to help us understand. What does he mean, you are the Christ? I know he's saying you're the Messiah, but let's look in Matthew 16. And if you don't want to turn there, let let me read this to you. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and sometimes another Gospel will help us to understand a passage in a greater way. And we're going to look in Matthew 16 a couple of times, but in 16, 16, it says, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, now listen to this, the Son of the living God. Peter had been experiencing the miracles, 
He had been seeing the things that were going on. He was hearing what Jesus was speaking about. And so he boldly proclaimed that Jesus Christ was the Son of the living God. But in a moment, we're going to look at the Scriptures again. And something happened once Peter proclaimed that Jesus was the Son of the living God and what Jesus was to do next, I think the disciples probably were ready for Jesus to say, yes, I am, and we're going to let this go public, and we're going to let everybody know right now. Instead, he didn't say that. And so the disciples were probably thinking, wow, Jesus, you just missed your moment. You missed an opportunity to let everybody know that you're the Son of the living God, that you are who Peter just proclaimed you to be. And so here we are. At that place, Peter proclaiming who Jesus is, and listen to what Jesus says in verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. Again, Peter was struggling with this. I think Peter was trying to figure out, what do you mean you're going to die? You're going to suffer? But you're the son of the living God. Why would you need to suffer? That doesn't work that way. And so Peter begins to kind of, in his mind, try to figure out what in the world is going on. And and he's going, I've got a better plan, I think. He begins to try to help Jesus understand that his way is probably not going to be the best. And in verse 32, it says, And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Now, I don't know about you, but there's something about that scares me a little bit. Okay? You just proclaim that Jesus is the Son of the living God, and now you're going to rebuke him? I'm telling you guys, that's a little scary for me. Because all of a sudden, Peter figures out that he's got a better plan than the Son of the living God. Now, before we start pointing fingers too much, don't we do the same thing? Don't we come to the God sometimes in our prayer times or in life, and things aren't going quite right, and, and we, we look at someone who's suffering or someone who's just died and someone who's been in a car wreck or or someone got promoted above me and we look at God and say God you've lost control let me help you here a little bit can I kind of give you the plan that we need can get us kind of back on course you ever do that come on you never tell God your plan and how you'd like to direct him you guys already got it all done I can go on no we don't I can tell you, every one of us in this room has sometime or another said to God, God, come on, here's how you can fix it. Here's the plan right now. Here's what I'd like to see you do. And so we begin to ask God to, to do a work to correct the situation. Here's the problem. We have finite minds. That means we think about what's happening right now, what's happening to me, and what's best for me. Right? So we begin to look at the circumstances, situation, and we figure it out based upon our our finite minds. Here's the difference. God has an infinite mind, an infinite amount of wisdom. He is an omniscient God, which means He's an all-knowing God. That means God can know the past. He knows the present. But He also knows the future. So He takes everything into account. And God doesn't work things out just for what's best for me, but He works it out for what's best for eternity. It's an eternal plan. It's a plan that makes sense when you look at it from a perspective and you step back and look at an eternal plan. And yet, again, so, it's so easy for me to be like Peter and say, but God, God, you really don't understand. Because... I need you to get back on track with me here. Let me share something with you, though. These aren't my words. These are God's words. Uh, Sometimes life, we again, we try to get God to go our way, and we're so often contrary to His ways. 
Listen to what God tells us in Isaiah 55. Now these are his words. These aren't mine. So listen. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. So let that soak in. So now God's speaking to us and saying, The thoughts that you're having... If they're all centered around you and how you want to fix what's going on, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And then he says, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Why? Because God, again, has an eternal perspective. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. God's saying... Look at the earth and look at the heavens. As far as you can see, he said, my ways are so much different than yours. It's like the difference between the earth and the heavens. That's a pretty big difference. And so when we begin to be like Peter and say, God, you're really messed up here. You missed your moment. We're not supposed to be suffering. We're not supposed to go through this. This shouldn't be happening. Then we're saying, God... We've got it put together better right here in our little finite minds than you do with all the perspective you have and all the understanding that you had. You created this, yes. You made it even know the number of hairs on our head or the lack of. And yet you know it all, and yet my ways are better than yours. That's what we say. So how did Jesus respond to Peter? He looked at him in verse 33 and turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. It's interesting that how quickly things change. Again, I want to go back to Matthew 16 because it gives us a little bit more detail of what's going on in, in the moments just prior to this. In verse 15, again, it says that Jesus said to the disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Simon and Peter replied, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjana. That's Simon Peter. He said, blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus had just affirmed Peter. And he said, you're right. I am the son of the living God, but it, and you're blessed, but it's not because you have it up here. It's not because of your understanding, but he tells him this in verse 17, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but it's my Father who is in heaven. Father God gave Peter an understanding that Jesus was the son of the living God. And so, it's on that type of faith that Jesus tells Peter, I'll build my church on a faith like that, an understanding like that. Peter, upon your faith, and a faith that, that proclaims that Jesus is the Son of the living God, I'll build my church on that. But it's because the Father has given you this insight. It's so am- amazing how we can move so quickly from being in a place where we trust God with our lives to a place where all of a sudden we're telling God what to do. Say, so, well, no, we don't. Yes, we do. Let me explain. When I'm worshiping over here, I get lost in the things of God. I just love to worship. And I love to just tell Him how much I love Him and I express my gratitude and my thanks and I'm worshiping and I'm, I'm just, I'm forgetting everything else. I'm not over there thinking about what happened this last week. My heart, my mind, everything is just soaking in the presence of God. Then the message is being proclaimed, and the Word of God, the truth is coming in and changing my heart and my life. Yes, 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 I believe that, I believe that, yes. And all of a sudden, worship time is over, our service is over, I've got my squirt gun, I pull it out, I'm ready to charge the gates of hell. Right? Come on, you can laugh at that. Don't we do that? Wow, God, I'll follow you no matter where we go. I've got my water pistol. We're going. Until Monday morning. You know what I mean. Something happens. And all of a sudden, something takes place in our life. And we get to the place where God, God, you've lost control again. 
God, did, did you take a nap? Did you fall asleep? Do you not realize what's going on here right now? And we began to lay out the plan of God again and we forgot that on the day before we said, I'll follow you no matter what happens. I trust you. It's because something takes place that causes us to lose sight. First of all, I think we've we've lost our belief that Jesus can take care of us. I love John 14, 15, 16, 17. I've said this to you guys over and over and over. Every time it almost seems like I get up here. Because that's the final instructions for us as his disciples. Jesus is saying, I've got some words for you and it's going to help you to make it in life. If you haven't read John 14 through 17, those four chapters in quite a while, read them every day for about a week. Because they're instructions for life. Listen to what Jesus says in John 16, 33. He says, I said these things to you that in me you may have peace. I love that. That means no matter what goes on in life, I can be assured that Jesus said, I'm going to bring you my peace. And I wished he would have stopped right there. But this verse goes on. It says, I said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. What do you mean? I thought you just said I'd have peace. Yes. I'll give you my peace. My peace will be with you. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace that will guard your heart and your mind. Even in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of a plan that doesn't look like it's going right. Why? And he finishes this verse out in John 16, 33. He says, but take heart because I've overcome the world. Church, that's good news. Jesus said, I've overcome the world. No matter what you go through, I still overcome, I still win. We know the way it ends. Jesus said, I overcome. I've overcome the world. So we have to trust in His peace. We have to believe that in the midst of the struggles and temptations and trials of life that Jesus says, my peace is there for you. We'll look at that again in a moment. I want to go back to Peter. So what's happened? How did Peter go from being a hero to a zero? How did he go from being the rock to being rebuked? I want you to look at verse 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus is speaking to each one of us. And he's saying what happened here is you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. When I lose sight, it's because I'm turning inward. I'm turning back to me. I want to take control again. I want to figure it out. I want to do it. But God says, don't set your mind on on yourself. Set it on me. I love Colossians 3.1. It says this, if then you've been raised... With Christ. If. If. If you know Jesus Christ and you're a Jesus follower, then he has some words for us. If then you've been raised with Christ, here, here's what we've got to do. Seek the things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things of this earth. The things of the earth will drag us down. But when we set our mind on Christ, we find new hope. We find peace. We find contentment in Him. For you have died, and there's that peace of dying to be a Jesus follower. You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We have to die. The key to setting our minds on the things of God is to die to self and to live in Christ. Now, I wish I could say that's easy, and it's not. It's hard to die to self. But it's what we're called to do. Look at verse 34. And Jesus is going to help us with this process. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, and we're the crowd, we're the disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Denying ourselves means to lay down our plan. 
laying down our plan and embracing his. Jesus didn't say, take up your cross and figure it out. He didn't say, take up your cross and no matter what goes on in life, it's all yours. If you go through struggles, if you have depression, if you, things just fall apart around you, tough deal. Take up your cross. That's not what he's saying. He, said, he says, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Jesus said, follow me. Follow my example. When Jesus went to the cross, I think it's a good example for us to understand about taking up a cross. You see, Jesus even was in the, the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed, Father, if it might be your will, could you take this cup from me? I don't think he was just overjoyed about going to the cross. He understood why he was going, but he wouldn't overjoy. Lord, if there's any other way, could you allow that to happen? And the Lord, Father God said, no. It's my will that you go to the cross. Jesus Christ laid down his life willingly so that an eternal plan could be put into play and we all could be redeemed. You see, a laying down of a life is for an eternal plan, not one that's very small in comparison where it's all about us. What is our cross? I believe again it's denying ourselves. That's the first step. Denying ourselves and believing that Jesus is the Son of the living God and we want to embrace that and we want to live for Him and allow Him to live through us. God, and through His Son Jesus Christ, saw that there was a brokenness in our relationship. And so God, with His most precious gift, His Son Jesus Christ, took that gift and gave it to us. You know John 3.16? Many of you learned it as a small child. Maybe the first verse you ever learned. For God so loved the world that He did what? He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. A precious gift. A gift that was perfect, spotless Lamb of God. And God gave us that precious gift to rescue us. Have we received that gift? Have you received that gift? Have we surrendered our life and said, here it is. I trust in you, Jesus. I trust in you and I want to follow your plan. How do we do that? How do we do it? Because I know I can't redeem myself. There's nothing that I can do to purchase that. How do I know that? There's a road map for salvation. Maybe it's been a while since we looked at that. Romans 3.23 tells us this. For all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I was sharing the good news with a gentleman years ago, and I said, we've all sinned and fallen short of the plan that God had for our lives. And he goes, I've never sinned. And he really believed that. I've never sinned. I said, let me ask you a question. Have you ever told a lie? He goes, yeah. And I said, well, God's plan is that we tell the truth. God's plan is we are ambassadors of truth. Because truth sets us free. Oh. And I said, so that was outside of God's plan. I said, have you ever been at a way where you're maybe mean or ugly or disrespectful to your wife? He goes, yeah. I said, then you sin. I mean, what do you mean? I said, because it says we're to love our wives like Christ loved the church. He goes, oh, I guess I sinned again. <laughs> and then I began to share with him that the problem with that is Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin, even one sin, is death. Well, you might say, well, we're all going to die, right? No, eternal death. It's a separation from God where no longer 
can we be with God. Sin separates us from Him. Our relationship is broken. For the wages of sin is death. And if that relationship is not restored when we die, we'll spend eternity separated from God. But that's not not how verse 23 of Romans 6 ends. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. Eternal life in Christ. Romans 5 8 says, so that you understand how you can get there, how you can receive this gift. Romans 5 8 says, for God demonstrates his love towards us, and that while we're yet sinners, and we all are, Christ died for us. For God demonstrated his love that way. Christ died for us. Do you understand that when Christ went to a cross, There was no sin in his life. He was a perfect individual. He was a perfect, spotless Lamb of God with no sin. The only one who ever walked upon this this world, this earth, with no sin. And yet as he hung on that cross, your sin and my sin were placed upon him. And it was through his shed blood and the offering of his life that redemption comes for each one of us. That's God's plan. That's His perfect gift. You mean I don't have to attend church a certain number of times in a month? You mean I don't have to read the Bible every day? I don't have to pray every day? And Yes, those are all great things, but they don't save you. You mean, don't I have to be baptized as a baby? Don't I have to take communion? No, none of those things save you. I can't pay a price for it? No. Well, I don't understand. Let me help you. Romans 10, 9. For if you'll confess with your mouth. Now listen to this. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised His Son from the dead. Hopefully you'll be saved. Is that what it says? That's what some of us believe. That's not what that verse said. It says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised His Son from the dead, here's what it says. You shall be saved. Period. Nothing else attached to it. I can't redeem myself. You can't redeem yourself. But Jesus Christ says, believe in me. Give me your life. Turn it over to me. I am the precious gift of God given for your redemption. And if you'll turn your life to me, I will save you. I'll redeem you. And then it becomes, it's no longer I who live now. But it's Christ who lives in me. Life changes. I'm a new creation. Things are different. No, I still have to live in the same world. I still have to understand that there's suffering and turmoil and tribulation around me but now I have a hope I have a peace I have clarity I have one who walks with me I have one that says follow me and watch how I'll lead you I want to go back and read verse 34 one more time to you where Jesus says deny yourself take up your cross and follow me but I want to read it to you out of the message this is a paraphrase it's in modern day language. Listen to this. This is what Jesus would be saying probably to us in this language today. Calling the crowd to join his disciples, Jesus said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Let me read that again. Jesus said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me. And I'll show you how. Is he in control of our lives? Is he in the driver's seat? So what do we do? If he is, how do we allow him to stay there? Because I know it's not easy. I believe we continue 
to proclaim that He's Lord. The Lord of our life. I do that every morning. I say, Jesus, you're Lord, and I want you to remain Lord in my life. I try to always do that. And I'm not saying you have to say it exactly that way, but I tell the Lord Jesus how much I love Him each morning. I tell the Father that. I tell the Holy Spirit. And I say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life again today. I reaffirm with my mouth that I want Him to be my Lord. I reaffirm that He's my Savior. I want to acknowledge who He is. I want to acknowledge His faithfulness. When we sing songs together here, that's what we're doing. We're acknowledging the faithfulness of God. We're acknowledging the great I Am. We're acknowledging the great name of Jesus. When we study God's Word together, we open it individually. I use His Word to reaffirm in my life that the Word is truth. The Word sets me free. The Word will give me life. That's what I have to keep clinging to. And I love to testify of the goodness of God. What He's done. You know, sometimes around here, or quite often, we'll say, as you leave, just take a little bit of time and mingle and talk and have community together. You know why we want you to do that? Testify of the goodness of God. Let people know what He did in your life. Listen to what others are saying. I'm stirred by that. I want to hear people testify of God's faithfulness and His goodness because it helps me to trust Him when I come into those hard times in life. Well, let me finish up. Look at verse 35. Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. He's saying, those of us who will cling to our way of doing things, if I choose to do it my way and never give Christ my life, he said, one day you will lose it. Because you'll be totally separated from God. But whoever loses his life, whoever gives their life to Jesus now, in this day and age, this time, before death, before we die as human beings, give Him your life. And He said, this is what happened. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? You could have all the wealth that you want. You could, you could have the biggest house. You can have the nicest cars. You can have all that you want. And yet, what does it profit a man if he loses his very soul, his life? That word soul, you can interchange with life there. Verse 37, for what can a man give in return for his soul or his life? You know what the answer to that is? What can we give? Nothing. Nothing. Only Jesus Christ can redeem our life. He's the one who paid the price when He went to the cross. He ransomed us. He he is the one who brings our relationship back together with God. Verse 38. Jesus says, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Boy, does that not sound like today. It sounds like he wrote it right out of of what's going on in our front news right now in the paper. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels? One more time. Jesus is standing in front of you right now. He's standing in front of me. And he's looking us in the eyes. Again, he can see everything that's in our heart. And he looks at you and I and says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Have you given Him your life? Have you trusted Him as your Savior? Can you know that you know that you know that He's the Lord of your life. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What we're asked to do is to be willing to die, die to be a Jesus follower. Laying down our life. 
Who's been leading? Who's been leading in your life? I had to ask that question this week in my own. Who's in the driver's seat? Who will we choose to follow? Here's what I want to do. I know that Pastor Daniel shared this last week, but these passages just take us to a place that for us not to ask, we would be denying what the Lord's Word is doing in our lives today. I think we've all been reminded of what Jesus has done for us. That we're all sinners. And we can't pay the price. We can't fix it. But there are people in this room today, there were in the last service, there were last night, who needs to have that restored relationship with God. And the way you start is by receiving Christ as your personal Savior. Giving Him your life. What I'm going to ask right now, don't be ashamed. It says, Jesus says, don't be ashamed to testify that I'm your Lord. I'm going to ask you to do something. If you want to give your life to Christ today, I'm going to ask that you stand at your feet right now. Stand up if you want to give your life to Christ. You see, without doing that, you'll spend eternity separated from God, a broken relationship. You can't do it after you die. It's a decision you make now. Is there someone, two, three, four in this room that would stand up right now, not ashamed of Christ, not ashamed of the gospel and stand up and say, I want to give my life to Christ right now. Stand up. Thank you. Someone else? Stand up. Thank you. Give your life to Christ right now. Stand to your feet. Don't be ashamed because He's going to change you eternally. You will no longer be separated from God. You will be restored into a right relationship. Stand to your feet right now. Give your life to Christ. There's probably someone live stream that's doing it right now. For those of you, while they're still standing, for those of you in this room say, I know I'm a Jesus follower, but guess what? I got back in the driver's seat, and I've been trying to take care of my life. I see you too. Thank you. And you're in the driver's seat, and you're saying, no, I need to let Jesus back in the driver's seat of my life. I want you to stand to your feet. You're recommitting your walk with God, with the Lord Jesus. She said, I went back and, and let Jesus in the driver's seat. Thank you. Look at that. Yes. You're making a huge step today. Say, I trust Him. I'm going to follow Him no matter what goes on. Thank you. Look what God's doing. Thank you. They keep standing. Thank you. It's not for me. It's to place Jesus back in the driver's seat. Let Him lead. Church, stand up. We're going to pray. As we pray, I want to pray for all of us. Especially for those of you who receive Christ. But I want to pray for all of us that we allow Jesus to really be in the driver's seat of our life. Father, thank You for salvation this weekend. Thank You for in this service right now, both in this room and those on live stream and even people, I believe, that are in this room that didn't stand up. And they're still in their mind trying to figure out, can this really be? that I can that easily have a relationship with God restored just by allowing Jesus to pay the price for my sin. Lord, help it to make sense today. For those who did stand, God, I pray that You would bless them in their walk. It won't be easy. It's not going to be perfect. But God, may they understand the peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. God, I pray for all those who stood today that would say, I want Jesus back on the, in the driver's seat. I'm a believer. I'm a Jesus follower, but I've been trying to lead. I want to give Him my life back. I want to let Him lead. Lord, I pray that You would bless these. I pray You would bless their endeavors and their walk with You. I pray that over those over live stream. God, may You do a miraculous work in all these lives, including every person in this church. I pray that Mountain Springs Church would be a church that follows Jesus. We don't follow Mountain Springs. We follow Jesus. God, do a work in our lives today. I pray that for me. 
God, I don't want to be in the driver's seat. I want to follow you. Do a work in our hearts. Thank you, God. Thank you for your faithfulness and your love for us. In Jesus' name, look at me for just